people from Germany and other countries here had discovered. Um, for those who are here who for the first time, maybe say a word about what the conversations are. When we were founded, we were founded in an inn, in a bar, or in a, in a hotel. Dominic was sitting down, chatting with a man. Um, so in a sense, when I started the conversations now in our eighth year, I had that call to conversations for that reason, that we would continue the tradition of a conversation that Dominic started in Toulouse, and we continue it now. And so over the last eight years, we've invited scientists, engineers, physicists, ex-prisoners, gay people, scripture scholars. We've had a whole group of people here, and they're part of our conversation, and that continues, and will continue on into the future. So in, in starting our eighth year, which is a very uh, good, uh, in a sense, tribute to the house here of Venice Moore, because when I started at first, I thought this may or may not last, but gradually as the years went on, it has become quite solid. So we're delighted that in the midst of the time we've had in COVID, that we've come back to start again. Thank you for supporting it tonight. We look forward to your continued support in the coming weeks and the coming months. You will see on your seats program for the coming year of conversations, and those of you who are who are familiar to the conversations will know that we put them under themes. So for the next two weeks, tonight and next week, we're looking at staying well and being well. Then for the next four weeks, following four weeks, we'll look at life in the church in Ireland today. The various speakers there you will see. And then a series of lectures or conversations in, in theology, mainly by our Dominican brothers uh, for the month of January. Then looking at uh, scripture for part of February, and finally in April, looking at spirituality and ending with the theme of justice, homelessness, uh, and the right to have a home. So the topics, the conversations this year, the eighth year, are as varied as previous years. So we're delighted that everybody is accepted to come to speak and that we can start uh, for another year. Tonight we welcome John Cummins, no relation of mine, since my second name is Cummins, there's no inside dealing here. Uh, John comes from East Cork, from Killa, and John lived with us for a number of, about a year and a half. We thought he would join us, but he didn't. Uh, a beautiful woman took him away, so... Um, John, his background, uh, currently he's working as a psychotherapist, but also working part-time uh, lecturing in UCC and involved in student health care in UCC. So we're very happy to uh, John has accepted our invitation uh, and I and invite you to give a warm welcome tonight to our first conversation. <laughs> So yeah, thank you Stephen. Um, I lived here for a year and a half um, and it's really interesting tonight to meet the person who took over from me. Living, I, was living, I lived here in the Gate Lodge um, and it was a funny time actually because I think I thought we, there, was, there was a homelessness crisis yes. only beginning back then but as is practice now a landlord will ask you to leave a house so that they can then make, make the rent higher and then someone else comes in and take it. So I was a bit, I, I kind of, not. I wasn't homeless, but I was looking to live again in the city and I'd been uh, coming here for a number of years. Um, and Stephen kindly offered me um, the Gate Lodge and it was a really nice time because at that time I was kind of, I was wondering where I was going to go next and I needed a little bit of time, kind of, not quite cloistered, but a little bit of a little bit of space for myself, um, and I think Stephen did actually hope that I join. Um, and, and I think there's a monk in here somewhere, um, but he didn't decide to join any order. He said he could stay in the real world, um, and not to say that this isn't the real world very much is. But uh, I guess I decided I'd stay and be a householder, um, and kind of see how I could kind of maybe bring kind of the qualities of contemplation into maybe the university or the healthcare setting that I was working in. Um, so I had that nice balance where I could have a nice quiet space 
But I also managed to have a Wi-Fi connection on Sky TV, so I wasn't completely isolated. <laughs> but I actually didn't watch a lot of it in the end. You know, I needed I needed a connection because I a Wi-Fi connection because I needed to reach the outside world, and I really saw the value of that. I needed to reach people in the states who I was connected to, and in the UK. Um, this was obviously before we we knew how important that would be. Um, and I got to use the house here. So I took my first meditation retreat here in this room. And I, I've spent in this room here four weeks in silent practice, which is kind of cool to say now, you know. At the time, I just, it was just something I wanted to do. Um, but when you spend that amount of time here, you get to know the place really, really well. And you get to experience all the, you know, the changes. I've been here in different seasons. Um, but it's quite profound to, to sit here early in the morning and see the sunrise up over the Port of Cork at different times of the year, you know, January, February, October, um, and to see the seasons change here as well, you know. So you've seen them change, the, the corn gets cut and it gets planted and it gets sown and it gets cut. And it's kind of very, it's a very contemplative atmosphere, you know, that, that you get to enjoy. And the library here, there's many, many books, and I read many of them um, because I would come and I would sit. And it was challenging at times because I was pr trying to practice more meditation, you know. I was trying to sit and sit with my mind, and my mind would go into, you know, <coughs> all sorts of stories. And I, sometimes I'd get very restless, so I'd come out here. It could be late in the evening and I'd walk mindfully underneath the lights here, so near the trees, and I'd go to the, the prayer room, and I'd sit there, and I'd come to the library. And I was doing these different things to kind of help my mind to settle down. And I think what I was really doing is I was learning to tolerate the uncertainties of life in all those moments. Um, and Rose, who's here this evening, um, gave me a very good quote. There's, you'll have to help me, Rose. The only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Yeah. So the only thing in life that is certain is uncertainty. So I always find with these actually, I was speaking to, to Alan and Bill, um, you know, I always learn something from someone else in, in the, you know, when I come to talk in any, in any group, there's always some wisdom that someone brings forward. And I think um, that would be good if there's, there's lots of wisdom here tonight. Um, because really what we're talking about is how can we live with uncertainty in a wise way, you know, and that comes with a bit of wisdom, you know, the, the, the certain thing in life is uncertainty. Um, so there's a kind of contemplative element to uncertainty, you know, if we're to just say, mention contemplative, you know. Um, and then there's, there's techniques, there's things we can use, you know, there's ways of understanding who we are and how we are in the world. There's a, there's a lot of commonality between all of us as kind of humans, you know, we all, anyone here not know what it's like to experience uncertainty? You know, everyone's experienced something uncertain, you know, something hasn't been certain until, you know, the last moment or, um, you know, until we can get it confirmed or we might, it might never be confirmed. But being able to, to tolerate it is a beginning, being able to live with it um, is really useful. Um, and that doesn't mean that we, we get to um, kind of eliminate or get rid of all of our worries, but we can develop a different relationship with how it is. Um, so that's just a way of kind of introducing, introducing the, myself and introducing the talk. Um, it's kind of setting the scene, I guess. Um, but I, I'd really love if, if you guys could kind of bring forward what you know, because essentially what we're all doing here is you know, I'm setting the scene or giving the frame, but we're, we're all teaching each other, you know. We're all, we're, we can all really learn from each other as well. Um, and you might be coming to these talks for a number of years, you know, you might have been brought along to talk this evening by somebody else. Um, but just to say as well, it's, it's, it's great to be able to sit in a room with people. I think this is probably the first time I've sat in a room with this amount of people in over a year and a half, which is kind of powerful. So thank you all for showing up. And I guess, you know, the fact that you're here, you, you bring something, and if only one of you weren't here, if only one person was missing, 
you know, the atmosphere would be different, things would change, you know. So um, don't underestimate the power of your intention for coming whatever way, you know, whatever that is, or it's just to be here to listen and, and to support the conversations. So yeah, in the spirit of that, um, you know, uh, it's interesting to know that um, like all great places, you know, the idea for the Dominican order started in a pub, or at least was formed in a pub, in an inn. Um, but obviously it began as well because of conversations. And when they began, they weren't sure how it was going to work out. They were ever certain, but you know, I don't know how many years it is now, but it's many, many years. Um, hmm? 800, you know, wow. Well, the thousand year view, you know, for sure you another 200 in that, um, or more. Um, one thing I like to mention here as well, just in the spirit of, of the place that is in Ishmore and the philosophy, is that, you know, um, I like to practice meditation, mindfulness, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and I've always found over the years that rather than that bring me away from spirituality or traditional uh, Catholicism, um, it kind of has brought me back closer to it actually and, and helped me to understand it more. So that's been an interesting um, interesting uh, change in perception or interesting way to, to know that kind of, you know, med meditation in all its forms um, supports, um, supports this, the contemplative spiritual element. Um, the work that I do currently, Stephen was asking me what my title is. I, I kind of struggle to give myself one, to be honest. Um, my background training is in mental health nursing. But I'm also trained in psychotherapy and med as a teacher in meditation, mindfulness meditation. But if, but if you were to call me by my identity, I work in the <coughs> student health centre in UCC. I work there with students who have complex mental health needs. Um, but before that, I used to work as a manager in HSC in mental health. So I managed a team during the pandemic. So that was my previous title. I don't do that anymore. Um, and I lecture students in the college as well, at the university. Um, and then I work in private practice for myself as well a couple of days a week. So I do those different things. And that helps me to kind of stay engaged. And then I do some things like this. I just have a chat with people and have a talk. Um, so yeah, where would we go from here? The, Violinist Martin Hayes. Have you, any of you guys ever heard of him? Do you know who he is? He has a great way of talking about you know music and playing the violin. You know, and he often says, you know, we have a plan, and then we don't know what's going to happen. You know, so I have a little bit of an outline of a plan here, and I don't really know what's going to happen after that. To be honest, I might even stick to this. So kind of one of the the um, the things I'm playing around with. Is literally uncertainty here, you know, um, and the style of giving the talk here really this evening um, is to kind of just really speak from what's arising in the moment, um, and you might, you guys might just see how that affects you. You, know, you might think he's come with the sheet, he's not prepared. That's, I couldn't do that. They'll kill me, you know. That's not how I live. Um, or you might think, okay, that. That, that's that's interesting, you know, be curious about that approach. So all I've really got is I've got this piece of paper, I've got the, the blank flip chart, I've got three markers, and then I've got, you know, I spent a lot of time reading books in here, so I've got the books that I read, they're in there somewhere, you know, um, and I've got an idea of how we might approach it. Um, but the pandemic, you know, we won't avoid the word, because we're living in one, we're living through history at the moment, you know, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, pandemics happen all the time, you know. There is even some degree of certainty that we would live through one in our lifetime, um, because it seems that every century or so that happens, but we didn't know when, you know. Um, so it's really shown us, you know, that we, we don't know sometimes what's around the corner. And for many of us, it probably just ripped off that veil of illusion that we had control over our lives um, when we really don't most of the time, you know. Um, and the, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks talk about this, they've talked about it, I don't know how many thousand years ago that was, uh, Stephen, when would you think that was? 800, whatever it was. Um, but they talked about, you know, chaos, you know, and they talked about complete, complete disorder, 
you know, um, and they talked about control, you know, and that as a, as a Gaia, as a world, you know, we're trying to maintain control and equilibrium, you know, and that, that, that actually is a very normal part of being human. We need that, you know, um, but then to be able to live in uncertainty um, is probably one of the greatest challenges any of us will ever have, you know, um, and and yet we, we all know something about it. Um, so I kind of want to bring in a practice. So it, it would, is that, would everyone here be open to trying a medit meditative practice, a mindfulness practice? Mm -hmm. So we'll spend just a little bit of time um, breathing. Um, and this is actually one thing that we can do to help tolerate uncertainty, is to breathe, to sit and to breathe. So take a comfortable seat. For yourself. If this isn't for you, that's okay. You can you can just kind of you know do something else, you know. Uh, but if it is, you know, take a seat that's comfortable for you. You know, you kind of you all have a posture there. And if you wish to, you can close your eyes, but you don't have to. Okay. And as you're sitting here, just begin. Just begin to be aware. Just to be aware. So we're we're Homo sapiens. What that really means is that we have the ability to be aware. So just being aware of how you are in this moment. What did you bring with you this evening? Did you bring any worries? Did you come with an open mind? Are you curious? Just noticing how you are. Listening to yourself. How are you right now? Maybe you notice an emotion that's here with you, if any. And the one thing we are certain of is the breath. We can be certain that we're breathing right now. All of us are breathing. Just beginning to notice your breath. You might even notice how it is to, to breathe with a mask on, you know. How is that? How is it to breathe and to notice your breath? And to be very gentle with it. You don't have to, to force this. You're just really noticing that I'm breathing. And it's moving in through the nose and down into the body. And it's very automatically then coming back out through out through the body again, it might come out through, through, through the nose or through the mouth, whichever. Just taking this moment to be aware of how you are as you breathe. And don't worry if your mind is telling stories or becoming distracted, it's all right. If it is, just gently coming back to awareness of the breath being aware of breathing. <coughs> and if there's any other distractions outside the room, that's all, that's all part of the practice. So just very gently noticing the next in breath. You breathe in, and as you breathe out. So on the in breath, when you breathe in, you stimulate the sympathetic, and when you breathe out, you stimulate the parasympathetic part of your nervous system. So just breathing down into the belly can help to regulate your nervous system, can help to regulate your body. And now just expanding your attention from the breath to just including the body, just feeling the body as you sit here in the chair. Just noticing breath and body. How is it to be aware of your body? And if there's distractions or loud noises, that's all part of the practice. You can still feel your body even partially sitting in the chair. You might know 
towards the feet, the hands. You might just notice how your spine, your spine is supporting you in sitting. Just being aware of the body. The breath and the body are always here. They're always present. No matter how busy your mind might be, that's all right, it's okay. Just seeing if you can allow the shoulders and the neck and just allow the body to soften a little and release. Just knowing here that we're, we're in a room with others, with many other people. <coughs> this is good. This is good for us as human beings. And if you haven't already done so now, just as you open the eyes, and as you orient to the room now, just noticing what's around you now. Kind of like fresh eyes, new eyes. And just broadening your perspective. Just broadening kind of, you know, you've got these two eyes. See if you can widen your attention. The mind is so much bigger than where we think it resides in the head. It's mind body. So just noticing. How does to be aware of the colours here? You might just notice different shades of colour, sounds. And you might notice the quality of presence, you know? There might be a quality of presence here. You're here. You might even notice the after effects of the practice. So, we've got some really precious time now to talk about uncertainty together and have a conversation about it. And I mentioned the Greeks talking about chaos and control, you know, and as humans, we like to feel like we're in control of things and control of life. And we will engage in certain ways of trying to control things. Okay? And one of those is worrying. Okay? So we'll worry. Worry is a means of trying to control something or rumination. We we'll ruminate on something or on an issue or a problem. And this is because we feel anxious because something might be uncertain for us in our lives. So I really want to see if we can talk about what uncertainty is. What do you know about uncertainty? How would you describe it? Rose, I'm going to ask for your help again. Does anyone here know in, in the group about uncertainty? How does it feel? What is uncertainty like? It's a bit unnerving. Hmm? It can be a bit unnerving. Unnerving. Yeah. Unnerving. Lucia and Francis. Francis. Thank you, Francis. Yeah, got the names right. So it's unnerving. What does unnerving feel like, Francis? Um, I just want to say a bit uncertain. Um, yeah. You can, you can feel perhaps a bit out of um, your, your depth. 
Yes, I wrote down. Out of my debt. Good images, though. What happens when you get out of your debt? What happens in the body? Butterflies. Yeah, so the body. The butterflies. Anything else? Can you get out of your debt? Panic. Panic. Yeah. Become tense. Worrying. Hmm? Worrying. Worrying. Worrying, yeah. So we've got the body, we've got the mind. They're not separate. Okay? We've got tension. We've got worry. What, what does worry? Sorry, did you mention worry? Yes. Can I get your name? Joe. Joe. Tell me about worrying. What does it feel like to you when you experience it? Where does it come from? Feels like it's come from my brain mm -hmm. and my and my stomach. Because if I'm giving it power. Your brain and your stomach, yeah. as if you're giving a... Yeah, as if I'm giving it a power. You're giving it a power. Ah, yeah. yes, thank you, yeah. So you're giving power to the worry. To the worry, yeah. And then I'm listening to the worry control me. So. And the worry controls you. you exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of how it works, okay? We worry because we feel anxious. We have a physical reaction in the body. And then what happens is we worry more, okay? To try and control the thing that seems uncertain. Is that making sense? Okay. So I'm going to introduce you guys <coughs> to a model of understanding this, okay? Just kind of, so you have what ifs actually I meant to mention, okay? experience a thought, and every human is going to experience some degree or level of uncertainty in their lives. And we're all going to try to control it. That's what we try to do with organisms, you know, as beings. We're going to try and control it. Worrying is one thing. So we have three systems in our brain. suit, okay? So this comes from a theory uh, by a professor called Paul Gilbert who founded Compassion Focused Therapy, it's kind of a form of therapy that I use a lot with students and with kind of myself as well. Um, so we've got threat, drive, the suiting system, okay? Usually this kind of intuitively gives people an understanding because in the threat system, We've got anxiety, we've got anger, we've got shame, we've got disgust. Okay? Here we've got worrying, we've got rumination. Okay? And essentially, this part of our brain needs to be on the lookout for different dangers. You know? That, that, we have to have that. And that's where our fight, our flight, our freeze, and what we call fawn reside as well. Okay. So this part of the brain is really interesting because we love, we're all going to know this really well. Okay. This is actually also where self-criticism comes in. Okay. We're going to get to the part about tolerating uncertainty as well, I think. I hope. Um, but I don't know. So we have a drive part of our brain. So what do you guys know about drive? Anyone here driven? Instinct. 
Gold. Instinct? Instinct. I mean gold. Gold, yeah. I like the instinct. It's a great word. Thanks, Bill. Instinct. Having goals, motivation. Yeah. So he had to drive to get here. And it wasn't just a car journey. It was, well, not sure about you guys here now, but certainly, Trisha, you had to drive to come here and you gave other people to drive to come with you. So you had to drive the motivation. So we all have a motive in life. There's a motive. You all had a motive in coming here, whatever it was, you know. It might just have been to learn something or do something different. So I know, Franz, I know your motive, Lucia, was to come here to learn something new. Yeah? Or to, to do something new because you have time now. Okay? So we have a motivation, a wish. We're driven. The students I see in the college, they have a drive to achieve. Um, you know, they want to, if you're studying medicine, you want to become a doctor, you know, or you want to you want to better yourself through some form of education. Does drive mean anything else to anyone here? You might there might be some wisdom here that you guys have. What does drive mean? Yeah, instinct is a good one. You know? Making choices. Choices. Yeah. I um I went to actually when I left here, when I left Inishmore. Um, after my contemplative time and my, my semi-cloistered experience, I said I'd go for a cloistered experience in a Zen monastery in uh, California. And so I flew out to, to California to this monastery that was way up high in the hills. Um, and I had to get someone to give me a lift out, you know. So you know those Tesla cars? At the time there was this company that would, you could hire a Tesla, someone to drive you. So I hired a Tesla and just, just 73 year old guy called Fred drove me out. So he, he picked me up in uh, LA and he drove me out to Palm Springs. And it's about a two and a half hour journey, you know. So Fred was a really interesting guy. He owned a, a freight company, um, a trucking company. But it was his third business and his third one that was successful. His third one was the one that was, was successful um, because the other two failed, you know. So we spoke about, and we talked about, we had a great connection. We spoke about life all the way out in the car journey, you know. So he told me about his failed businesses, the first one and the second one. He had, he had instinct, but he didn't have the instinct to know that he'd got in too far and he was going to fail. So by the time he got to the third one, he'd, um, he'd realized um, how to achieve his goals. But by the end of the two and a half hour car journey, the two of us kind of distilled the whole thing down. What was life all about, you know? Life is all about choices. Life is really all about choices. I could have actually got him to drive me back to the airport in California and get back on the plane, because I think I'd learned all I needed to learn at that point anyway. Um, but it was really interesting. Life is all about choices. It's something I've never forgotten, because it is all about choices, you know? Life is about choice, what we choose, you know? And also understanding as well is that we've been put here on this earth with this really complex, tricky brain that we didn't choose. So we didn't choose to have this threat system or this drive system um, in the way we have it, you know. Um, that's the one thing we didn't choose, actually. Um, but now we have it, we have to work with it, we have to get to know it. So we have the soothing system, okay. So what, what do you think when you hear me say the soothing system, part of our brain? Relax. Compassion. Yeah. Relax. Yeah. Anything else? What have we done during the pandemic, some of us, to help soothe our brains while we've been locked down? What are the natural things we start to come back to? Nature. Nature, yeah. If you didn't know it, you were tolerating uncertainty by getting out in nature. Okay? Natural natural way to get out of nature. Or some people rediscovered, like in all the weeks I've sat here in this room in my silent meditation, so many people come back and say, all that time I spent out in the wall garden, you know, it was profound. <coughs> I saw a robin every day, you know, I saw nature. It opened my eyes because I slowed down. So we have nature. What else is there? The scripture resources. 
spiritual resources. Spiritual resources. Spiritual yeah, spiritual resource. And we can what what are what are those? What are those resources? So there's meditation, there's prayer. Belief. Belief. Yeah. Someone said yeah, belief, you said yeah? Yeah, belief, yeah, belief. Prayer. Meditation. You know, uh, there are resources. Um knitting, sewing, baking, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, they're all there. Relationships and connection. Connection and because I've talked to a lot of people about connection and social connection and how important it is, you know. Um, but it's not just social connection, connection can come in so many ways, can't it? You know, you might just connect to a book that you read, you know, you're forming a connection to the character. So, connection is huge, actually, you know. Um, I remember I bought a tin whistle one time in Killarney, so I wanted to learn to play it. And, I learned a, a little bit, but when I bought it, the, again, you always learn something from people, don't you? The guy in the shop said, congratulations, you'll never be lonely again, you know? And I, again, like Fred in the car in California, I was like, oh, that's, that's a good one, you know? Um, and even with the spiritual resources, the last time I, I, I spoke here, there was a woman, um, and we had a conversation at the end, and I can't remember who it was, what she said to me, there's no coincidences in this life, you know, spiritual, there's a spiritual aspect, your spiritual belief that kind of helps you or maintains your, your soothing system actually, gives you that. So inherently, we know how to work with uncertainty, and to tolerate it, you know, um, because it does cause us distress, you know, it causes us causes that restlessness, that stomach, you know, that achy feeling in the stomach. It can make us agitated, you know, because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and we, we already know that we have access to these type of things, for most of us anyway, that can help us to tolerate that distress. Okay, we call that distress tolerance. And you wouldn't uh, create mm -hmm. a routine? Routine? Routine will be here. In drive. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's not really routine to be a soothing thing to do. <clears throat> yeah, so things can go into both. Okay. So, yeah, so it's not, so it's not like meant to be a black and white. Kind of so, routine, okay, let's talk about this from the title of the talk. What does routine give you? It gives you certainty. <laughs> yeah. That's that's not bad. Yeah. That can be, so that can help you with worry. I've got a routine. I've got something I want. I can achieve, and then that routine actually helps me stay calm. Yeah. So it kind of goes across. It helps the systems. I talk to people all the time about what percentage they might think they're in these. You know. So if you were to say, and again, this is just a kind of a way of kind of talking about it. If you were to say how much time you're in each one of these. And each one, each circle was 33%. You know, how often would you think you are in threat, drive, and the soothing system? You know, so most people say, I'm John, I'm 70% in this one at the moment, 70% in threat, and then I've got maybe drive 20%, 30%. I might have maybe none here. If you're a student who really wants to get their exams done, you might be huge drive. That, but that drive might wear you out, you might be worn out from it. Um, and you might, you might have some um, anxiety here, uncertainty, worry about passing the exam, and this one might be so well developed. One of my friends recently, who was on maternity leave, said she's got loads of this. She's got lots of green and soothing, you know? way more than she has of these. So we, we move, we tend to move between the different systems. Um, and if we can understand it from the point of any of these, but 
you know, worry is the what if, you know. We want to get a sense of control over our lives. And that's where <coughs> that feeling of uncertainty comes in. I don't know what's going to happen. And there's a, I'm just going to check the time now, so I'll see where we're at. Oh yeah, we've got a little bit of time. Yeah, there's a few other little things here that can, we can talk about, but we, as we don't know. Um, we don't know what's going to happen for, for the rest of the talk. We're going to leave it uncertain. Someone might have a, have a question. Do you kind of get this model? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here is the one that helps you tolerate uncertainty, but you need all three. Okay. But then there's the contemplative aspect of uncertainty, okay? So one of the great Zen masters, I don't forget who he was, but it was <clears throat> one of them, <clears throat> his quote is, not knowing is most intimate. Okay, it's kind of like a koan. Do you guys know what a koan is? It's a koan is like something that you sit and, could be a story, it could be a story or it could be something that you, just a quote that you sit and you meditate on. And then through the process of meditation, you move more from trying to figure it out up here to kind of figuring it out with here and here, or like we do here, you know. Um, so yeah, not knowing is most intimate. It's always really interesting. What's that mean? Anyone take anything from that? Not knowing. It's most intimate. It's a koan. Not possessing. Not possessing. Okay. Sorry, could you spell that word again? Koan. Koan. K O A N. Okay. Koan. It might be the. How do you pronounce it? So, not possessing. Okay. So, can I ask you more about that? The quotation you gave again, John, is not knowing is most intimate. Yeah. <coughs> because I suppose knowing can become <coughs> selfish or power, power, yeah. and therefore letting go is freedom, is it? Yeah. yeah. And that's sort of intimacy of who you really are. Okay. Okay, yeah. So the intimacy of who you really are, the truth of who you are. Yes. So <coughs> you, could, you could meditate on that for a week. You know, but we all know what it's like to not know. We all know what it's like to actually feel it in the body. And we know that we can give it power by worrying over it. So the antidote, and this is my, this is my antidote now, it mightn't be, you mightn't hear this anywhere else or someone might disagree with me. The antidote to uncertainty, I think, is trust. Okay, so there's a few people nodding their heads. So what's trust? What do you know about trust? As a... Faith. Hmm? Faith. Faith. Yeah. yeah. So we're moving now from the kind of psychology, shifting to the contemplative. Is that okay? So, faith. What's the difference between the two of those? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, Stephen? Fate and fate. One is of the heart and one is of the head. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm really relying on you guys here for this. <laughs> Would you agree, Stephen? Not particularly. Hmm? Not particularly. Not particularly. But I like it, heart and head. <laughs> okay. And faith can, for me, can be, F-A-I-T-H, can be maybe a trust of, in a belief that something might be true or not. The F-A-T-E part is maybe more predefined in some way for me. Predefined, okay. One is positive and one is negative. There's a positive and a negative. Which is positive, which is negative? I 
Hey, what's, what makes a negative? What's a negative? What makes faith negative? One is there is the response to the other, or the result rather the other. One is a result of the other. Yeah, faith, okay. in the long term. Okay. What's needed is trust, okay? What's needed with uncertainty is trust, okay? So has anyone ever felt really uncertain about something and then it worked out? It worked out okay in the end. So you need a level of trust. So this is the this is the the, the spiritual resource, the ability to be able to feel uncertain and get to know it and be able to feel it in the body. So we know it from the mind, we know it appears as worry, <laughs> and it'll appear in the body as a physical feeling, but it also will appear, you'll feel it in the heart. And you can feel that uncertainty, but then you can feel also a, a quality or element of being able to trust in life, essentially. So this is the contemplative piece, okay? Head, heart, or Mind, body, heart. Okay. How's that sitting with people? Well, I'm sitting here thinking there are millions of people who have no faith mm -hmm. in a religious sense. Mm -hmm. And they do precisely what you've just said. They trust in life. Mm -hmm. And they trust in their relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. They trust in their relationships over people. I'm really interested in that. Where, how have you seen that come forward in people who might have a what we call a traditional, maybe, faith? I think it's actually what sustains most of humanity. What their relationships it? with other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else agreeing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It sustains. It's powerful, isn't it? Things, you know, community, connection, and it helps you to tolerate the uncertainty of life. You know, sometimes a good, you know, there's many, there's like just so many wise people you meet, you know, but it takes a quality of wisdom as well to know that that we have in all of us because we all have, we all have this in us. The system is here. We've got this really tricky brain that we can't control a lot of the time. But here we can trust in something. And it can give us that connection, that community. Anyone heard of Moncon McGann? Yeah. 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 Moncon's a really, really interesting guy. He's traveled the whole world. Um, and I used to listen to his travel show. But you know, if you go and see Moncon talk or hear him speak, he kind of says that he just trusted in life and people look after him. Essentially, you know. Kind of, it's, very, it's, it's very free, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm kind of kind of curious, and I, I, again, I'm a bit uncertain here, but can any of you guys feel a bit of trust in you at the moment? Okay, Trisha, yeah. can you feel some trust? Yeah, huge. Where do you feel it? Oh, you mean physically? Yeah, physically, yeah. Or maybe what, in whatever way you feel it, because I'm learning from you. What, where, where is it? Is it appearing in the mind? Is it appearing in the body? Hmm. It's, it's all over. I mean, it's both my, mental and physical. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's all over. It's a full body feeling. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Anyone else feeling that sense of connection to trust? You see how yours? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of it is to do with kind of acknowledging your vulnerability in yourself. Ah, thank you. <laughs> now we're getting down, we're getting down and dirty. We're getting into the something that can be difficult, really difficult for people, vulnerability. You know, we're getting, you know, because what's the, I'm talking the antidote to, sh to uncertainty is trust. What's the opposite of vulnerability? The, the shadow side. Shame, you know, shame can keep us away from connecting to community, you know, it can put us into the red, into the threat, but vulnerability 
you got to be vulnerable here before you can be vulnerable there. You know, or you, you, Trisha or Lucy, you can be vulnerable enough to offer something here to me, and I can see where that goes. So we're kind of we're, we're in a shared vulnerability here, so we don't know what's coming up, but we can express ourselves, and that's that's connection, you know. Um, so vulnerability. So Lucy, do you mind me asking you what does that feel like? I'm pointing here because I'm really excited. Yeah, well, um, well, to me, it's kind of expansion, kind of. Uh, when you're with people that you can feel safe with yes. and vulnerable with, and I think a lot of us kind of seek those kind of relationships. Yeah, safety yes. and safe relationship. Yeah. It helps you tolerate uncertainty. Yeah. Because you know someone else is stuck in the mud when you're stuck in the mud, you know? Or when you're giving yourself a hard time, you talk to a friend, do they give you a hard time with it? They usually. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. It helps you get out. But you've got to be vulnerable, you've got to really bring it. And, you got, and, there, and, and what's the key element in vulnerability and safety in relationship? Trust. Yeah, we've got to trust something like that. That helps us to tolerate the difficulties in life, you know. Because we're going to face them, you know. Um, you know, one of my one of my very close friends at the moment, her her one of her family members is very sick and they don't know what's going to happen, you know? <laughs> There's a lot of trust in things are supposed to, things will turn out the way they're supposed to turn out. Or one of my other close friends recently just had a baby and she went to the, the doctor and he said, we're going to induce you. She said, no, I'm going to trust that my body and my baby know when the time is right. And they did, you know, it worked out fine. Um, they went for the, the more vulnerable option. Um, so we've got five minutes, five more minutes of total uncertainty now. <laughs> we don't know what way it's going to go. Like the violinists, like Martin Hayes or Moncon or, you know, any of these people, you know, and again through history. You know, the Dominicans didn't know where it was going to go and 800 years later, you know, they're the wandering rabbis of their, you know, they just literally walked around and, you know, somebody fed them, you know. Um, or, you know, people will hitchhike across the world and they trust that there's a lot more kindness than there is bad, bad things happening. Um, you know, with the pandemic, you know, a lot of good things happened, you know, a lot of, a lot of kindness. A lot of people, you know, where I live, one restaurant just made 300 meals every day for local people. You know, that really came true because everybody was feeling vulnerable, you know. So we got to pull together. All of those things help us to tolerate, help us to tolerate the uncertainty of the pandemic. What I'm really curious here, and I kind of, I'm going to take a second, just going to kind of sense into what's here in the room. I'm really curious about this for the last few minutes. Is there anything else for anybody on trust and vulnerability? Anyone else getting a sense of that appearing in the body, in the mind? I'm certainly getting a sense of presence. So you might feel disconnected from yourself, or you might feel kind of present in here, just paying attention. Um, but I think for me, the mind, body, heart, not knowing is most intimate. We can kind of get to know that we see, you know, when we connect to it, we connect that sense of trust, we can, we can see our own vulnerability, we can see what we need, we need safety in ourselves. And if you can listen to yourself, you know, turn in towards yourself, even for a moment, you can see what you need and you can know what you need to be able to tolerate anxiety, tolerate uncertainty, you know. So, storm Ophelia a number of years ago, you know, I remember my, my mom started baking for the first time in years again, you know. That really helped, you know. Um, and, 
trusting in life piece as well, you know. Often when I work with people in one-to-one practices in psychotherapy, we'll see what the head is saying, we'll see what the belly is saying, and we'll see what the heart is saying. Okay? And usually, fear is in the belly. Stomach. Yes. Yeah. So you get a bit of trust and vulnerability in the heart. And then you'll get the head trying to run the show and tell you what to do. That's the worry. And you need all of them. But you need to be able to listen to them. You need to be able to listen to what's here in terms of trust. You need to be able to listen to your fear to know how to work with it. Or listen to your anxiety. And then once those three are connected, you can trust that you're on the right path or the right road. Easier said than done. And it's a lifetime of practice and work. Um, but everybody here has got the capacity and ability at this time and age to be able to do it. Okay. I think we finished there. Is that all right? <coughs> so thank you all for coming here. Thank you all for engaging and, um, and giving contributions.